Hey everybody, welcome back to When Harry Met Board Games, where we feed our people with relatable content and our victory condition is your satisfaction. I'm Harry and today we have another top 10 list for you all. Today I'm going to be covering my top 10 cooperative board games and I absolutely love and adore each of these games and there's even some games that didn't make it to the list that I love so it is clear that I do enjoy this genre one thing I encounter quite often with some of the people I game with and even some of my subscribers on this channel is the idea that cooperative games are less interesting than competitive games because you need some human opponent that you must lord your victory over but to me the competitiveness in these cooperative games is that the game itself the engine of the game creates an artificial opponent so to speak that quite often is much more challenging than any human opponent you could ever find and the idea the prospect of working together working collaboratively building those team building skills that i think are essential to all of us as human beings and using them to you know come and overcome the obstacles that these games present with the ultimate objective of coming out victorious at the end as a team making the necessary sacrifices as individuals sometimes listening to each other group thinking all of these things make for amazing gameplay experiences and of course just the genius designs that quite often are involved in all of these board games with that all being said we're going to move straight to my number 10 cooperative board game of all time and this is a big one Marvel Legendary deck building game and I must say that if this is probably my favorite out of all 10 of these games yet it's my number 10 cooperative game because when I think of this game for whatever reason it's not the game that I think of because I'm in the mood to play a co-op it's in the I'm in the mood of immersing myself in the Marvel Universe I'm in the mood of learning some new Marvel hero characters here and what their powers entail going across or again, some new masterminds or some new villains, figuring out how to overcome these different schemes. That's really what I get into this game about. From a cooperative perspective, it is fun. There is still some good collaborative experiences that can be had. I believe Legendary Encounters system, especially Aliens, tends to work better for that from what I hear, but I've never played that game. And that probably would replace if i ha if i would play it i could imagine it would re replace something like marvel legendary at least for this kind of list top 10 cooperative games so even so it's an amazing deck builder it's fun you could play it semi-cooperative you could even play it competitively but i do find that it's best at as a cooperative experience my number 10 cooperative board game of all time a Marvel Legendary deck building game. And now we move on to my number nine, and that is Forbidden Desert, designed by Matt Leacock, the king of the co-op games. And this game is a sequel to Forbidden Island. Forbidden Island is more of a gateway, family weight, even children weight cooperative board game. While this is a little bit meatier, a little bit more interesting, uh, I love the system that they have here with the artificial intelligence and the sandstorm that is constantly influencing and affecting the board, right? You have these sand tiles that inundate the different spaces in the board, make them immovable, block them off. You're going to have to work to excavate to, um, to remove some sand. You're going to have to gain some equipment, some doom blasters that allow you to push sand away in, in large amounts. Uh, because one of the ways you lose the game is by having the sand tiles run out, but also just the sand tiles on the player board is an obstacle to begin with because what you're trying to do is you're trying to excavate all of these different spaces on the board and find out what's underneath, ultimately trying to find the four um, artifacts that you need in order to complete your getaway ship. There's a getaway ship that you're using to fly away from this desert. This is a fun game, lots of great collaborative experiences. Each player controls a different character with a unique ability that helps them to break the rules and helps them to be um, of use to their uh, co-workers, to their teammates. Some roles uh, emphasize more, you know, strong abilities to, to overcome and cheat the rules. Others are more like helpful role player work uh, roles where you can really help your teammates out. It's not so much about what you can do individually, but perhaps you can help your teammate out with that special ability. This game is fun. There is no expansion content. 
Replayability, I think the game has enough replayability because of the genius of the system, of the auto, um, AI and the, and the sandstorm and how it's manipulated. I think that part is cool. So it does have some replayability, uh, replayability despite not having any expansions. But that is my number nine cooperative game of all time, Forbidden Desert. Now we move on to my number eight, and that is Lord of the Rings, designed by Reiner Knizia. And this is the original co-op game and this game is phenomenal i love this game now first of all i do highly enjoy the lord of the rings tolkien um universe that's something that i immerse myself in that's something that i'm fascinated by that's something that intrigues me and always keeps me captivated and involved in the gameplay experience although yes this game is a little bit abstracted but you do have the different player boards the different adventure boards that this game is comprised of that represent different uh, chapters or stories along the Lord of the Rings lore th throughout the Lord of the Rings story and you're trying to make it to the end of this you and your teammates and there is a bunch of sacrifice going on because sometimes players have to take corruption and you have to make the tough decision of who's going to take the corruption because if you advance too far in the corruption track you become susceptible you become vulnerable to Sauron and to his attacks as he advances on the corruption track uh, you're making all these decisions as, as to who's going to be the ring bearer because from round to round, from board to board, you might not have the same ring bearer and you have to make the decision that's best for the team. If a player is too far advanced in the corruption track, it's not wise, it's not for the in the best interest of the team for that player to be the, to, to be the ring bearer, right? You want to have whoever is the ring bearer to be further back on the corruption track and further away from Sauron, right? This is a fun game, it's always exciting, it's always the climax always feels very, very interesting. Uh, I lose this game quite often. I only remember winning this game once, but every time I lose, for the most part, it's a very interesting experience where I feel like I have a really good chance of winning. And that's the most that I can ask from a co-op game. My number eight cooperative board game of all time, Lord of the Rings. And now we move on to my number seven co-op game, and that is Xeno Shift Onslaught. Designed by, who is this designed by? I don't see the designer's name on the cover. Oh, uh, well, I know it's published by Cool Mini or Not, come on games. And this game is a fun deck building cooperative game, tower defense game. Basically, there's an onslaught, as the title uh, indicates, of aliens in the form of giant insects who are attacking your base. And your base has a certain amount of life points according to how many players are playing the game. And each player has their own unique division within this uh, universe, which indicates what their special ability might be, any special bonuses that they might get from round to round or turn to turn. And also, each player has their own lane in which they're putting their different units and they're adding equipment cards and weapons and armor to these different units in order to strengthen them and prepare them for the onslaught of the aliens. But on that lane that they control, they're also going to be putting enemy cards face down. And you're going to be revealing these face down enemies one by one and comparing their stats with your units and seeing who takes the casualties, who takes the hits. Sometimes you'll be able to outlast some of your enemies, kill them. Sometimes your enemies will be able to outlast your units and kill them. And then at the end of this conflict phase, you will see if there's any, any, any enemies left in your lane. And if there are, whatever attack power they have, they will deal that to the base. And basically, you're just trying to outlast the wave of, of hordes, the hordes of insects that are attacking your base. This round, this game consists of nine rounds, and if you can outlast those nine rounds, you are the winner. You're not trying to accomplish any other objective. You're not trying to eliminate a particular enemy. You're just trying to survive, and surviving in this game is so hard. I mentioned I've only won once at Lord of the Rings. Up, up to now, I have never won a game of Xeno Shift, and I've never, there's nine rounds, I've never gotten past the seventh round, and even so, I find this game phenomenal. And the cooperative aspect of this game is probably the best out of all ten of these games, the collaborative nature of this game, because in this game, players can literally hand the cards, it's a deck building game, they can hand the cards that they just purchased to their opponents so that the opponents can put it in their lanes. That is so cool. That is so neat. There's so many different ways that you can help your opponent. The deck building phase of, the, of each round 
is simultaneous play. And basically players are just talking and discussing and agreeing as to what approach or what direction they should take as individual players and ultimately as a team. Really, really fun, cool. I love the deck building mechanism. I love the unique, not only theme, but the unique implementation of gameplay tower defense game in a deck building game really cool my number seven deck uh cooperative board game of all time xeno shift onslaught and now my number six co-op game of all time and that is star trek expeditions designed by reiner knizia another reiner knizia co-op game here another intellectual property game designed by reiner knizia and this is published by WizKids. This is a phenomenal game. Now, I do moderately appreciate and enjoy Star Trek. I was a, a, a decent fan of The Next Generation back when I was a younger kid. Um, and, and a few of the other spin-offs were mildly interesting to me. However, I'm not a huge fan. I'm not a Trekkie, so to speak. But I do like the intellectual property. I have been watching the movies, uh, the more recent movies in order to prepare myself for playing this game and this game is just phenomenal each player controls one of the four main characters of the movie um and basically each character has a, has a special power special ability that makes him or her different and also on this track over here you have the uss enterprise the starship enterprise and you have the klingon cruiser and the Klingon battle cruiser, and basically they are approaching each other. They're getting closer to each other. They are attacking each other from time to time, and that's kind of like in the background of the game, right? It's not the main idea of the game. The main idea of the game is that your different crew members, starting from um, from Captain Kirk, are all exploring this island here of Nibia. This island this planet of Nibia and each of the different sp spaces has a different challenge that you're trying to accomplish some of these challenges are helpful to you to get you more victory points because there is some victory points so you could compare your highest score total to previous games but others are directly related to one of the three missions you're trying to accomplish because that is how you win the game you need to accomplish three missions and each of the missions is divided into three phases so basically there's nine challenges you need to accomplish in order to complete this game really fun they're hero clicks miniatures each of the characters as well as the ships so as certain things happen to them they take damage you rotate them on the hero clicks in order to indicate that they've taken damage their stats are listed on the bottom of that hero clicks clicks miniature and their stats adjust depending on how they take damage and how they heal, right? The more damage they are, the lower their stats are. And each character has strengths and weaknesses in one of the three different major stats. You also acquire different crew cards that increase uh, your stats when trying to accomplish particular missions or particular objectives. There's a ways that you can exchange tokens with your opponents that could help them. There are ways where you can exchange cards with your opponents so you can help them. Uh, just the idea of beaming back and forth from the Starship Enterprise and back to the planet for different reasons in order to make travel throughout the planet more efficient because you could beam anywhere back onto the planet even though it's not going to be on the same turn. Uh, also, you can go back to the Starship Enterprise because you want to heal. You want to go to uh, to sick bay and, and heal your character who desperately needs some healing. And also because someone needs to be there to man the ship if you're ever going to engage in battle with the Klingon battleship. So all of these different factors finding the right balance trying to figure this all out and there's also a timer in the game so you do not have an infinite amount of time in order to accomplish these missions because if the timer runs out you have lost the game really fun the intellectual property makes it work Ryan Knizia once again with a brilliant design my number six cooperative board game of all time Star Trek Expeditions and now we move on to my top five and we've got Eldritch Horror, designed by Corey Kaneska and Nikki Valens, and published by Fantasy Flight Games. This game is a fun Cthulhu Mythos HP Lovecraft themed board game where players each take the role of different investigators, each with different unique abilities, special powers, different stats, and they're working to 
close these portals that have opened up throughout the world. The map is basically a map of the entire world. So I do like the global aspect of this. And all these different portals that are a break within the fabric of reality that allow these ancient ones to enter from other dimensions and wreak havoc on our earth. And we're trying to find a way to not only combat and defeat these uh, ancient ones and all the other monsters that have been unleashed as a result of these breaks within the fabric of reality. But we are also trying to do this while maintaining our health, maintaining our sanity. We're acquiring different assets, different weapons, different resources, uh, different spells even, and working collaboratively to cover the map, to meet certain objectives, to solve certain mysteries, and ultimately to close all of these portals and defeat the ancient one before the ancient one him him or herself actually enters our reality all before the doom track runs out right because once that doom track runs to the very end we have lost the game this is really cool there's a bunch of different asymmetric powers that you're running uh the storyline feel of it the game comes with four different ancient ones and all the ancient ones have their unique cards that are added to the different decks so each game will feel different based on who uh, is the ancient one you have these different encounter cards which are very story driven and you're always going to be drawing different encounter cards because each encounter card has three possible encounters you're going to engage with depending on what part of the world or what type of city you're in on the world really cool really fun highly replayable very immersive very team oriented very challenging game my number five cooperative board game of all time, Eldritch Horror. And now we move on to my number four. And my number four for many people is their number one. And it is Pandemic. Designed by Matt Leacock. Again, the king of the co-ops. And this is a very popular cooperative board game where players are all working as a team of CDC, the Center of Disease Control. Very relevant to our times right now. And they are going throughout the world is again this is a the board consists of a global map they're going to all these different cities and they're trying to uh treat the viruses but at the same time they're working towards finding a cure for each of these different viruses and there's at least four viruses in the base game the expansions add a fifth virus and so on and so forth but it's fun because each player again has their own unique character ability i think that's one of the coolest things with some of these some of these cooperative games that they have these different roles that work differently and just finding how to collaborate and make it work and solve the puzzle because there is a little bit of a time element also there is the impending doom of certain epidemics that really spread the virus at a more rapid pace and and could potentially lead to outbreaks which a, a certain amount of outbreaks is how another way in which you could lose the game but figuring this all out is such a fun process and if you ever get bored of the base game there are three wonderful expansions that add so many modules and so much so much content to not only rev up the difficulty of the game but make it a, a cooler more interesting even more immersive and thematic experience now i will say this this is number four for me perhaps if i've played legacy which i still have not till this day played pandemic legacy any of them it might jump up a little bit more, right? If I factor in that legacy experience into the formula. But for now, it is still my number four cooperative board game of all time, Pandemic. Now we move on to my number three. And my number three is Pandemic The Cure. How about that, folks? So I am putting Pandemic The Cure above Pandemic. This is the dice version of Pandemic. Basically, players are rolling dice, first of all, to inform in, uh, determine what cities get infected by what viruses because the actual dice are your viruses in this game as opposed to cubes also each player has their own customized dice based on their special character and these dice are completely different from the other player and those are the dice that they're rolling to determine what actions they have available for a turn i find that to be so cool and so neat because it makes the distinction from character to character and from player to player even greater than regular pandemic now, I will say because there is a lot of dice rolling, it does tend to feel a little bit more luck-based than Pandemic. But the fact that this game is a significantly shorter game also kind of makes up for that, right? You do have a little bit more randomness, but it's not like the game is as long or longer than Pandemic. It's a good 15 minutes shorter than Pandemic, I would say. So that kind of makes up for it. Really fun. I don't have any expansions for it yet, but 
Right now, it's still relatively new to me and I have been enjoying it. And that's why it's my number three cooperative board game of all time, Pandemic the Cure. Now we move on to my number two, and that is Shadows Over Camelot. And this is a game that I was so close to making this my number one cooperative board game of all time. But the number one, I'll explain shortly. So this is designed by Serge Leget or Leger, Serge Leger, and Bruno Cathala, and published by Days of Wonders. I believe this is currently out of print. This is a King Arthur themed game where each player is either King Arthur himself or one of the Knights of the Round Table. And again, different special abilities for each character. Really, really cool. And we are going on a bunch of different quests. And it's kind of like a sandbox of a co-op game. You have so many different quests that you can go to based on a hand of cards and which quest you feel like your hand of cards is best suited for, right? So there's a lot of you know, discussion and so on and so forth. However, you're not supposed to reveal the contents of the actual cards. Lots of players find ways of cheating without directly saying, but they basically are telling each other what they have, code language and code words. But for that, you might as well ignore the rule altogether and just tell people what you have. Me and the people that I play with, we follow that rule to a T. Yes, we might indicate that our hand is weak or our hand is strong, but that's as detailed of information as we would get right you still don't have any idea if by my hand being weak i mean i have a bunch of threes twos and ones right you just know that i'm not good enough to go somewhere where i would require perhaps lots of fives that's pretty much the extent of it all and one of the reasons why it's so important to protect the information of this game the hidden information from player to player as opposed to many other co-op games where information is more freely shared is because this game has the potential of a trader, the possibility of a trader. And again, I play with the possibility of a trader, other players play with the guarantee of a trader, because I find it more intriguing. The idea that you're strongly accusing a person, you're so sure that they're the trader, but you know what, you're a little bit reserved because you know what, they might not be the trader because again, they might not even be a trader. And then at the end of the game, you spend an entire game accusing one another and you find out that there is no trader. And that's just a hilarious moment and all the apologizing for the accusations starts to kick in. But this is such a fun game. It's mechanically speaking, so simple. You're basically playing poker hands in all of these different quests but you're doing it turn by turn and one by one. And there's so many different ways of progressing evil, which is one of the things you have to do in your turn, but you have to make the tough decision as to how, again, like many good co-op games, there's plenty of opportunities for self-sacrifice to make those other centered altruistic decisions because you're thinking about the better good, right? The needs of the many outweigh the, those of the few. That kind of mentality in a cooperative game, it's so much fun, so exciting. My number two cooperative board game of all time, Shadows Over Camelot. And now, folks, we go to my number one. And again, it was tough. I strongly considered my number two over my number one. But I ultimately went with my number one here because of how rich the gameplay is. And that is Robinson Crusoe, designed by Ignacy Trevicek, published by Portal Games. This game is a phenomenally hard cooperative board game. My wife and I have only played the first scenario and we have won one time by the skin of our teeth, but we felt so good, so fulfilled, so satisfied because even that first scenario, which is supposedly the easiest scenario in the entire base game, was challenging for us to figure out. But it's so much fun. This is a worker placement game where uh, teammates are working together to do these their, their worker placement actions. But every work, every character, again, every player has a special character with unique abilities. And in this game, each character has like four unique un abilities, not to mention a unique equipment that they bring to the game. So they very much are distinguished from one another in that regard. But you're going together and deciding what spots you want to trigger. And there's so many different options, so many different actions. You're managing so many resources. You're dealing with these event decks that constantly throw monkey wrenches into your best laid plans. You're dealing with all of these other decks that also affect your game in a negative way more often than not. Dealing with all of these things, trying to accomplish whatever the objective of your current scenario might be. 
And the base game comes with seven scenarios, I bet. There, I, 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 um, I, know, I, I could say. And there's a bunch of expansions for this game. The expansions add lots of further scenarios, other characters even. And some of the expansions, I think, even add campaigns and things of that nature. So that's all really cool and really neat. Um, so again, just the worker placement action, the managing the resources, the calculating. Uh, there's weather in this game. You have to take into account the weather effects because you might progress from summer to fall to winter where snow starts to fall and you need to have a shelter with a nice you know modern or at least technologically you know sufficient roof in order to with, with, withstand the onslaught of snow and rain that will befall that house over the course of the different winter seasons which is all determined by a roll of a die. But it's really, really cool. You have animals to work to worry about, different predators, different challenges, poison. So many things, so many decisions that you make that go back into the event deck and eventually come back out and, you know, turn out to bite you in the butt. All these things that you have to factor in with every single decision that you make. Trying to have food at the end of each round in order to feed your group of people because if you don't feed your people, you lose life. And that's another neat concept that each of your characters has health that deteriorates as certain things happen, you know, hunting animals, again, weather conditions, all these different things, not being able to feed themselves, all these different things make them incur damage, which ultimately can make them die. And if one of the players dies, that is one of the ways you lose the game. Really cool, brilliant design. My number one cooperative board game of all time, Robinson Crusoe. And that's it, folks. That's all for my top 10 cooperative board games of all time. Comment down below. Tell me what you think about this list. Perhaps you're not interested in cooperative games. Maybe you're curious, but you haven't found the right theme or the right designer or the right design that catches your interest. Let me know what you think about these choices for my top 10. I'm Harry from Harry Met Board Games saying take care, everybody. Stay safe, stay healthy, and have fun gaming. Bye-bye.